We were seated at breakfast one morning, my wife and I, when the maid brought in a telegram. It was from Sherlock Holmes and ran in this way. Have you a couple of days to spare? Have just been wired from the west of England in connection with Boscombe Valley tragedy. Shall be glad if you will come with me. Air and scenery, perfect. Leave Paddington by the 11.15. What do you say, my dear? said my wife, looking across at me. Will you go? I really don't know what to say. I have a fairly long list at present. Oh, Anstruther would do your work for you. You've been looking a little pale lately. I think that the change would do you good, and you are always so interested in Mr. Sherlock Holmes's cases. I should be ungrateful if I were not. Seeing what I gained through one of them, I answered, but if I am to go, I must pack at once, for I have only half an hour. My experience of camp life in Afghanistan had at least had the effect of making me a prompt and ready traveller. My wants were few and simple, so that in less than the time stated I was in a cab with my valise, rattling away to Paddington Station. Sherlock Holmes was pacing up and down the platform, his tall gaunt figure made even gaunter and taller by his long grey travelling cloak and close-fitting cloth cap. "'It is really very good of you to come, Watson,' said he. "'It makes a considerable difference to me, having someone with me on whom I can thoroughly rely. "'Local aid is always either worthless or else biased. "'If you will keep the two corner seats, I shall get the tickets.' We had the carriage to ourselves, save for an immense litter of papers which Holmes had brought with him. Among these he rummaged and read, with intervals of note-taking and of meditation, until we were past reading. Then he suddenly rolled them all into a gigantic ball and tossed them up onto the rack. "'Have you heard anything of the case?' he asked. "'Not a word. I have not seen a paper for some days.' The London press has not had very full accounts. I have just been looking through all the recent papers in order to master the particulars. It seems, from what I gather, to be one of those simple cases which are so extremely difficult. That sounds a little paradoxical, but it is profoundly true. Singularity is almost invariably a clue. The more featureless and commonplace a crime is, the more difficult is it to bring it home. In this case, however, they have established a very serious case against the son of the murdered man. Is it a murder, then? Well, it is conjectured to be so. I shall take nothing for granted until I have the opportunity of looking personally into it. I will explain the state of things to you, as far as I have been able to understand it, in a very few words. Boscombe Valley is a country district not very far from Ross in Herefordshire. The largest landed proprietor in that part is a Mr. John Turner, who made his money in Australia and returned some years ago to the old country. One of the farms which he held, that of Hatherley, was let to Mr. Charles McCarthy, who was also an ex-Australian. The men had known each other in the colonies, so that it was not unnatural that when they came to settle down, they should do so as near each other as possible. Turner was apparently the richer man, so McCarthy became his tenant, but still remained, it seems, upon terms of perfect equality, as they were frequently together. McCarthy had one son, a lad of eighteen, and Turner had an only daughter of the same age but neither of them had wives living. They appear to have avoided the society of the neighbouring English families, and to have led retired lives, though both of the McCarthys were fond of sport, and were frequently seen at the race meetings of the neighbourhood. McCarthy kept two servants, a man and a girl. Turner had a considerable household, some half-dozen at the least, that is as much as I have been able to gather about the families. Now for the facts. On June 3rd, that is on Monday last, McCarthy left his house at Hatherley about three in the afternoon, and walked down to the Boscombe Pool, which is a small lake formed by the spreading out of the stream, 
which runs down the Boscombe Valley. He had been out with his serving man in the morning at Ross, and he had told the man that he must hurry, as he had an appointment of importance to keep at three. From that appointment he never came back alive. From Hatherley Farmhouse to the Boscombe Pool is a quarter of a mile, and two people saw him as he passed over this ground. One was an old woman whose name is not mentioned, and the other was William Crowder, a gamekeeper in the employ of Mr. Turner. Both these witnesses depose that Mr. McCarthy was walking alone. The gamekeeper adds that within a few minutes of his seeing Mr. McCarthy pass, he had seen his son, Mr. James McCarthy, going the same way with a gun under his arm. To the best of his belief, the father was actually in sight at the time, and the son was following him. He thought no more of the matter until he heard in the evening of the tragedy that had occurred. The two McCarthys were seen after the time when William Crowder, the gamekeeper, lost sight of them. The Boscombe Pool is thickly wooded round, with just a fringe of grass and of reeds round the edge. A girl of fourteen, Patience Moran, who is the daughter of the lodgekeeper of the Boscombe Valley estate, was in one of the woods picking flowers. She states that while she was there she saw at the border of the wood and close by the lake Mr. McCarthy and his son, and that they appeared to be having a violent quarrel. She heard Mr. McCarthy the elder using very strong language to his son, and she saw the latter raise up his hand as if to strike his father. She was so frightened by their violence that she ran away and told her mother when she reached home that she had left the two McCarthys quarrelling near Boscombe Pool, and that she was afraid that they were going to fight. She had hardly said the words when young Mr. McCarthy came running up to the lodge to say that he had found his father dead in the wood, and to ask for the help of the lodgekeeper. He was much excited without either his gun or his hat, and his right hand and sleeve were observed to be stained with fresh blood. On following him they found the dead body of his father stretched out upon the grass beside the pool. The head had been beaten in by repeated blows of some heavy and blunt weapon. The injuries were such as might very well have been inflicted by the butt-end of his son's gun, which was found lying on the grass within a few paces of the body. Lestrade, being rather puzzled, has referred the case to me and hence it is two middle-aged gentlemen are flying westward at fifty miles an hour, instead of quietly digesting their breakfasts at home. I am afraid, said I, that the facts are so obvious that you will find little credit to be gained out of this case. There is nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact, he answered, laughing. Besides, we may chance to hit upon some other obvious facts which may have been by no means obvious to Mr. Lestrade. You know me too well to think that I am boasting when I say that I shall either confirm or destroy his theory by means which he is quite incapable of employing or even of understanding. To take the first example in hand, I very clearly perceive that in your bedroom the window is upon the right-hand side, and yet I question whether Mr. Lestrade would have noted even so self-evident a thing as that. How on earth, my dear fellow! I know you well. I know the military neatness which characterizes you. You shave every morning, and in this season you shave by the sunlight. But since your shaving is less and less complete as we get farther back on the left side— until it becomes positively slovenly as we get round the angle of the jaw, it is surely very clear that that side is less well illuminated than the other. I could not imagine a man of your habits looking at himself in an equal light and being satisfied with such a result. I o However innocent he might be, he could not be such an absolute imbecile as not to see that the circumstances were very black against him. Had he appeared surprised at his own arrest or feigned indignation at it, I should have looked upon it as highly suspicious. 
because such surprise or anger would not be natural under the circumstances, and yet might appear to be the best policy to a scheming man. His frank acceptance of the situation marks him as either an innocent man, or else as a man of considerable self-restraint and firmness. As to his remark about his deserts, it was also not unnatural, if you consider that he stood by the dead body of his father, and that there is no doubt that he had that very day so far forgotten his filial duty as to bandy words with him. And even, according to the little girl whose evidence is so important, to raise his hand as if to strike him. The self-reproach and contrition which are displayed in his remark appear to me to be the signs of a healthy mind, rather than of a guilty one. I shook my head. Many men have been hanged on far slighter evidence, I remarked. So they have. And many men have been wrongfully hanged. What is the young man's own account of the matter? It is, I am afraid, not very encouraging to his supporters, though there are one or two points in it which are suggestive. You will find it here, and may read it for yourself. On my way I saw William Crowder, the gamekeeper, as he has stated in his evidence, but he is mistaken in thinking that I was following my father. I had no idea that he was in front of me. When about a hundred yards from the pool I heard a cry of cooee, which was a usual signal between my father and myself. I then hurried forward and found him standing by the pool. He appeared to be much surprised at seeing me, and asked me rather roughly what I was doing there. A conversation ensued which led to high words, and almost to blows, for my father was a man of a very violent temper. Seeing that his passion was becoming ungovernable, I left him, and returned towards Hatherley Farm. I had not gone more than one hundred and fifty yards, however, when I heard a hideous outcry behind me, which caused me to run back again. I found my father expiring on the ground with his head terribly injured. The coroner, I am afraid that I must press it. Witness, it is really impossible for me to tell you, I can assure you, that it has nothing to do with the sad tragedy which followed. The coroner, that is for the court to decide. I need not point out to you that your refusal to answer will prejudice your case considerably in any future proceedings which may arise. Witness, I must still refuse. The coroner, I understand that the cry of cooee was a common signal between you and your father. Witness, it was. The coroner, how was it then that he uttered it before he saw you? and before he even knew that you had returned from Bristol. Witness. I do not know. A juryman. Did you see anything which aroused your suspicions when you returned on hearing the cry, and found your father fatally injured? Witness. Nothing definite. The coroner. What do you mean? Witness. I was so disturbed and excited as I rushed out into the open that I could think of nothing except my father. Yet I have a vague impression that, as I ran forward, something lay upon the ground to the left of me. It seemed to me to be something grey in colour, a coat of some sort, or a plaid, perhaps. When I rose from my father I looked round for it. But it was gone. Do you mean that it disappeared before you went for help? Yes, it was gone. You cannot say what it was. No, I had a feeling something was there. How far from the body? A dozen yards or so. And how far from the edge of the wood? About the same. Then if it was removed, it was while you were within a dozen yards of it. Yes, but with my back towards it. This concluded the examination of the witness. In spite of the light brown dust coat and leather leggings which he wore in deference to his rustic surroundings, I had no difficulty in recognising Lestrade of Scotland Yard. With him we drove to the Hereford Arms, where a room had already been engaged for us. "'I have ordered a carriage,' said Lestrade as we sat over a cup of tea. 
I knew your energetic nature, and that you would not be happy until you had been on the scene of the crime. It was very nice and complimentary of you, Holmes answered. It is entirely a question of barometric pressure. Lestrade looked startled. I do not quite follow, he said. How is the glass? Twenty-nine, I see. No wind and not a cloud in the sky. I have a case full of cigarettes here, which need smoking, and the sofa is very much superior to the usual country hotel abomination. I do not think that it is probable that I shall use the carriage to-night. Lestrade laughed indulgently. "'You have, no doubt, already formed your conclusions from the newspapers,' he said. "'The case is as plain as a pikestaff, and the more one goes into it, the plainer it becomes. Still, of course, one can't refuse a lady, and such a very positive one, too. She had heard of you, and would have your opinion, though I repeatedly told her that there was nothing which you could do which I had not already done. But he is right. Oh, I know that he is right. James never did it. And about his quarrel with his father, I am sure that the reason why he would not speak about it to the coroner was because I was concerned in it. In what way? asked Holmes. It is no time for me to hide anything. James and his father had many disagreements about me. Mr. McCarthy was very anxious that there should be a marriage between us. James and I have always loved each other as brother and sister, but of course he is young and has seen very little of life yet, and, and, well, he naturally did not wish to do anything like that yet. So there were quarrels, and this, I am sure, was one of them. And your father? asked Holmes. Was he in favour of such a union? No, he was averse to it also. No one but Mr. McCarthy was in favour of it. A quick blush passed over her fresh young face, as Holmes shot one of his keen, questioning glances at her. Good-bye, and God help you in your undertaking. She hurried from the room as impulsively as she had entered, and we heard the wheels of her carriage rattle off down the street. I am ashamed of you, Holmes, said Lestrade with dignity, after a few minutes' silence. Why should you raise up hopes which you are bound to disappoint? I'm not over-tender of heart, but I call it cruel. I think that I see my way to clearing, James McCarthy, said Holmes. Have you an order to see him in prison? Yes, but only for you and me. Then I shall reconsider my resolution about going out. We have still time to take a train to Hereford and see him tonight? Ample. Then let us do so. Watson, I fear that you will find it very slow, but I shall only be away a couple of hours. I walked down to the station with them, and then wandered through the streets of the little town, finally returning to the hotel, where I lay upon the sofa and tried to interest myself in a yellow-backed novel. The puny plot of the story was so thin, however, when compared to the deep mystery through which we were groping and I found my attention wander so constantly from the fiction to the fact that I at last flung it across the room and gave myself up entirely to a consideration of the events of the day. And then the incident of the grey cloth seen by young McCarthy. If that were true, the murderer must have dropped some part of his dress, presumably his overcoat, in his flight, and must have had the hardihood to return and carry it away at the instant when the sun was kneeling, with his back turned, not a dozen paces off. What a tissue of mysteries and improbabilities the whole thing was! I did not wonder at Lestrade's opinion, and yet I had so much faith in Sherlock Holmes's insight that I could not lose hope, as long as every fresh fact seemed to strengthen his conviction of young McCarthy's innocence. It was late before Sherlock Holmes returned. He came back alone, for Lestrade was staying in lodgings in the town. "'The glass still keeps very high,' he remarked as he sat down. "'It is of importance that it should not rain before we are able to go over the ground. "'On the other hand, a man should be at his very best and keenest for such nice work as that, "'and I did not wish to do it when fagged by a long journey.' 
I have seen young McCarthy. And what did you learn from him? Nothing. Could he throw no light? None at all. I was inclined to think at one time that he knew who had done it, and was screening him or her. But I am convinced now that he is as puzzled as everyone else. He is not a very quick-witted youth, though comely to look at, and, I should think, sound at heart. I cannot admire his taste, I remarked, if it is indeed a fact that he was averse to a marriage with so charming a young lady as this Miss Turner. Ah, thereby hangs a rather painful tale. And now let us talk about George Meredith, if you please, and we shall leave minor points until tomorrow. There was no rain as Holmes had foretold, and the morning broke bright and cloudless. At nine o'clock Lestrade called for us with the carriage, and we set off for Hatherley Farm and the Boscombe Pool. "'There is serious news this morning,' Lestrade observed. "'It is said that Mr. Turner, of the Hall, is so ill that his life is despaired of.' "'An elderly man, I presume,' said Holmes. "'About sixty. But his constitution has been shattered by his life abroad, and he has been in failing health for some time.' This business has had a very bad effect upon him. He was an old friend of McCarthy's, and I may add a great benefactor to him, for I have learned that he gave him Hatherley Farm rent-free. Indeed, that is interesting, said Holmes. Oh, yes, in a hundred other ways he has helped him. Everybody about here speaks of his kindness to him. Really. Does it not strike you as a little singular that this McCarthy— who appears to have had little of his own, and to have been under such obligations to Turner, should still talk of marrying his son to Turner's daughter, who is presumably heiress to the estate, and that in such a very cocksure manner, as if it was merely a case of a proposal, and all else would follow. It is the more strange, since we know that Turner himself was averse to the idea, Men who had only known the quiet thinker and logician of Baker Street would have failed to recognize him. His face flushed and darkened. His brows were drawn into two hard black lines, while his eyes shone out from beneath them with a steely glitter. His face was bent downwards, his shoulders bowed, his lips compressed, and the veins stood out like whipcord in his long sinewy neck. His nostrils seemed to dilate with a purely animal lust for the chase, and his mind was so absolutely concentrated upon the matter before him that a question or remark fell unheeded upon his ears, or at the most only provoked a quick, impatient snarl in reply. Swiftly and silently he made his way along the track which ran through the meadows, and so by way of the woods to the Boscombe Pool. It was damp, marshy ground, as is all that district. And there were marks of many feet, both upon the path and amid the short grass which bounded it on either side. Sometimes Holmes would hurry on, sometimes stop dead, and once he made quite a little detour into the meadow. Lestrade and I walked behind him, the detective indifferent and contemptuous, while I watched my friend with the interest which sprang from the conviction that every one of his actions was directed towards a definite end. Here is where the party with the lodge-keeper came, and they have covered all tracks for six or eight feet round the body. But here are three separate tracks of the same feet. He drew out a lens and lay down upon his waterproof to have a better view talking all the time rather to himself than to us. These are young McCarthy's feet. Twice he was walking, and once he ran swiftly, so that the soles are deeply marked, and the heels hardly visible. That bears out his story. He ran when he saw his father on the ground. Then here are the father's feet as he paced up and down. What is this, then? It is the butt-end of the gun as the son stood listening. And this? 
Ha ha! What have we here? Tiptoes, tiptoes. Square two, quite unusual boots. They come, they go, they come again. Of course, that was for the cloak. Now, where did they come from? He ran up and down, sometimes losing, sometimes finding the track, until we were well within the edge of the wood and under the shadow of a great beech, the largest tree in the neighborhood. Holmes traced his way to the farther side of this and lay down once more upon his face with a little cry of satisfaction. How do you know, then? The grass was growing under it. It had only lain there a few days. There was no sign of a place whence it had been taken. It corresponds with the injuries. There is no sign of any other weapon. And the murderer is a tall man, left-handed, limps with the right leg, wears thick-soled shooting boots and a grey cloak, smokes Indian cigars, uses a cigar holder, and carries a blunt penknife in his pocket. There are several other indications, but these may be enough to aid us in our search. Lestrade laughed. I'm afraid that I'm still a sceptic, he said. Theories are all very well, but we have to deal with a hard-headed British jury. Nous verrons, answered Holmes calmly. You work your own method, and I shall work mine. I shall be busy this afternoon, and shall probably return to London by the evening train. And leave your case unfinished? No, finished. But the mystery? It is solved. Who was the criminal, then? The gentleman I describe. But who is he? Surely it would not be difficult to find out. This is not such a populous neighbourhood. Lestrade shrugged his shoulders. Now from this double point our research must commence, and we will begin it by presuming that what the lad says is absolutely true. What of this cooey, then? Well, obviously it could not have been meant for the sun. The sun, as far as he knew, was in Bristol. It was mere chance that he was within earshot. The cooey was meant to attract the attention of whoever it was he had the appointment with. But cooey is a distinctly Australian cry, and one which is used between Australians. There is a strong presumption that the person whom McCarthy expected him to meet at Boscombe Pool was someone who had been in Australia. What of the rat, then? Sherlock Holmes took a folded paper from his pocket and flattened it out on the table. This is a map of the colony of Victoria, he said. I wired to Bristol for it last night. He put his hand over part of the map. What do you read? he asked. A rat, I read. And now? he raised his hand. Ballarat. Quite so. That was the word the man uttered, and of which his son only caught the last two syllables. He was trying to utter the name of his murderer. So-and-so of Ballarat. It is wonderful, I exclaimed. It is obvious. And now, you see, I had narrowed the field down considerably. The possession of a grey garment was a third point which, granting the sun's I found the ash of a cigar, which my special knowledge of tobacco ashes enabled me to pronounce as an Indian cigar. I have, as you know, devoted some attention to this, and written a little monograph on the ashes of one hundred and forty different varieties of pipe, cigar, and cigarette tobacco. Having found the ash, I then looked round and discovered the stump among the moss where he had tossed it. It was an Indian cigar, of the variety which are rolled in Rotterdam, and the cigar holder. I could see that the end had not been in his mouth, therefore he used a holder. The tip had been cut off, not bitten off, but the cut was not a clean one, so I did use the blunt penknife. Holmes, I said, you have drawn a net round this man from which he cannot escape, and you have saved an innocent human life as truly as if you had cut the cord which was hanging him. I see the direction in which all this points. The culprit is Mr. John Turner, cried the hotel waiter, opening the door of our sitting-room and ushering in a visitor. 
The man who entered was a strange and impressive figure. His slow limping step and bowed shoulders gave the appearance of decrepitude, and yet his hard, deep-lined, craggy features and his enormous limbs showed that he was possessed of unusual strength of body and of character. His tangled beard, grizzled hair, and outstanding drooping eyebrows combined to give an air of dignity and power to his appearance. But his face was of an ashen white, while his lips and the corners of his nostrils were tinged with a shade of blue. Yet I would rather die under my own roof than in a jail. Holmes rose and sat down at the table with his pen in his hand and a bundle of paper before him. "'Just tell us the truth,' he said. "'I shall jot down the facts. "'You will sign it, and Watson here can witness it. "'Then I could produce your confession at the last extremity "'to save young McCarthy. "'I promise you that I shall not use it "'unless it is absolutely needed.' "'It's as well,' said the old man. "'It's a question whether I shall live to the Assizes.' so it matters little to me. But I should wish to spare Alice the shock. It has been a long time in the acting, but will not take me long to tell. You didn't know this dead man, McCarthy. He was a devil incarnate, I tell you that. God keep you out of the clutches of such a man as he. His grip has been upon me these twenty years, and he has blasted my life. I'll tell you how I first came to be in his power. It was in the early sixties at the diggings. I was a young chap then, hot-blooded and reckless, ready to turn my hand to anything. I got among bad companions, took to drink, had no luck with my claim, took to the bush, and in a word became what you would call over here a highway robber. There I parted from my old pals and determined to settle down to a quiet and respectable life. I bought this estate, which chanced to be in the market, and I set myself to do a little good with my money, to make up for the way in which I had earned it. I married, too, and though my wife died young, she left me my dear little Alice, even when she was just a babby, her wee hand seemed to lead me down the right path, as nothing else had ever done. In a word, I turned over a new leaf, and did my best to make up for the past. All was going well, when McCarthy laid his grip on me. I'd gone up to town about an investment, and I met him in Regent Street, with hardly a coat to his back or a boot to his foot. "'Here we are, Jack,' says he, touching me on the arm. "'We'll be as good as a family to you. "'There's two of us, me and my son, "'and you can have the keeping of us. "'If you don't, it's a fine law-abiding country as England, "'and there's always a policeman within hail. "'Well, down they came to the West Country. "'There was no shaking them off. "'And there they have lived rent-free, on my best land ever since. There was no rest for me, no peace, no forgetfulness. Turn where I would, there was his cunning, grinning face at my elbow. It grew worse as Alice grew up, for he soon saw I was more afraid of her knowing my past than of the police. He was urging his son to marry my daughter with as little regard for what she might think as if she were a slut from off the streets. It drove me mad to think that I, and all that I held most dear, should be in the power of such a man as this. Could I not snap the bond? I was already a dying and a desperate man. Though clear of mind and fairly strong of limb, I knew that my own fate was sealed. But my memory and my girl both could be saved if I could but silence that foul tongue. I did it, Mr. Holmes. I would do it again. Deeply as I have sinned, I have led a life of martyrdom to atone for it. 
but that my girl should be entangled in the same meshes that held me was more than I could suffer. I struck him down with no more compunction than if he had been some foul and venomous beast. His cry brought back his son, but I had gained the cover of the wood, though I was forced to go back to fetch the cloak which I had dropped in my flight. That is the true story, gentlemen, of all that occurred. Well, it is not for me to judge you, said Holmes, as the old man signed the statement which had been drawn out. I pray that we may never be exposed to such a temptation. I pray not, sir. And what do you intend to do? In view of your health, nothing. You are yourself aware that you will soon have to answer for your deed at a higher court than the Assizes. I will keep your confession, and, if McCarthy is condemned, I shall be forced to use it. If not, it shall never be seen by mortal eye. And your secret, whether you be alive or dead, shall be safe with us. Farewell, then, said the old man solemnly. Your own deathbeds, when they come, will be the easier for the thought of the peace which you have given to mine. Tottering and shaking in all his giant frame, he stumbled slowly from the room. God help us, said Holmes after a long silence. Why does fate play such tricks with poor helpless worms? I never hear of such a case as this that I do not think of Baxter's words and say, There, but for the grace of God, goes Sherlock Holmes. James McCarthy was acquitted at the Assizes on the strength of a number of objections which had been drawn out by Holmes and submitted to the defending counsel. Old Turner lived for seven months after our interview, but he is now dead, and there is every prospect that the son and daughter may come to live happily together in ignorance of the black cloud which rests upon their past. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.